I was wanting to ask, you know, you were talking about the evidence that there is uh, and the dispute about the evidence of these different approaches, but I feel like it's worth trying to drill down a bit into what the approaches are and what makes them truly different. Because I, I feel like most people might assume that the difference between going to see a uh, psychoanalytic therapist and someone who is very much a, a CBT person, you say actually the CBT person is doing a lot of psychoanalytic things without necessarily realizing it but if they're, they're effective, effective they right are. okay right but it's not just a question of in one place it's one set of techniques that are being i'm being told to put into practice in my life and in another it's a different set of techniques it's a much more it seems to me like it's a much more fundamental difference in an understanding of like what it's so a fundamentally what different is. approach to practice it's a fundamentally different set of assumptions about uh about how and why people change, it's a fundamentally different approach to doing therapy. So if you watch CBT sessions, at least the version of CBT that, uh, that tends to get promoted most by academic researchers and publicized the most, um, if you watch video recordings or read transcripts of the sessions and you read uh, transcripts of psychoanalytic or psychodynamic sessions, um, they're very different things going on. They're unmistakably different. One of these is to do with the role of the therapists themselves, right? Yeah. Well, so let me go back to one of the things that you've said to begin with. The, the principle behind CBT or the cognitive part of CBT is that our emotional responses are controlled by our thoughts and beliefs. That was the starting premise of cognitive therapy. If we can change our beliefs, uh, that will in turn change our um, change our mental states, change our feelings, address feelings like depression, anxiety, and so on. So the idea was that our thoughts and beliefs caused these emotional states. In fact, that's also scientifically false. It's absolutely incompatible with everything that we know about neuroscience. So we actually have separate brain regions. We don't really have one brain. We actually have multiple brains. We have multiple brain structures that work uh, you know, independently and in concert. But there's centers for the brain that deal with logical, rational processing, the kind of beliefs that cognitive therapists are likely to deal with. We have parts of the brain, the amygdala, that deal with more primitive emotional responses. Um, and it's not the case that the one part of the brain is under the control of the other part of the brain. Um, in fact, there are actually more neural pathways going from the emotion centers to the thought centers and vice versa. In other words, scientifically, it's far more accurate to say that our emotional responses alter our thinking than it is to say that our thinking determines our emotional responses. So the most basic premise of this approach to therapy actually is scientifically false. Um, I'll give you a much simpler example. Um, uh, there's a very prominent, uh, well-respected researcher who's been a, a champion of cognitive behavior therapy for, for decades, and he sort of recently changed his tone that, that cognitive therapy needs to be done differently. And uh, it was just last week I read a paper by, by him, and he opened the paper by talking about some older research showing we actually have neural pathways that go directly to our retina, to our emotion centers that, um, that create a, a fight-or-flight response. Mm -hmm. The idea is from evolutionary purposes, if you see something that's potentially dangerous, it is far, far too important to be mediated by rational beliefs and thinking and decisions and judgment. Um, the flight or flight response occurs instantly, independently of any thoughts or beliefs you might have about it. And he, I mean, it, it's, it's quite a complex paper, but he really reasons from this observation to the conclusion that we can't change emotional reactions, deep-seated, you know, uh, deep-seated, intense emotional reactions, simply by working with thoughts and beliefs. And we actually I, need to deal with the emotions themselves. And this is, I mean, yeah, this is an interest. I go back and forth about which side I feel an affinity with here, but this is a very seems a very persuasive point that like if we had evolved to be able to shut down a fear response by thinking uh, a, a different something different, like well we wouldn't have evolved. I mean that would be a tremendous. We, we, no, we, we wouldn't have evolved. These these sort of life and death decisions, the kind that you know the kind that come down to fight or flight. Mm -hmm. um, you know they they really need to be handled. Uh, they really need to happen automatically. You know? And from an evolutionary uh, point of view, 
these mechanisms that lead to a fight or flight response predated the development of brain centers that deal with you know higher order logic and reasoning and you know thought processes. I mean, predated them by you know vast amounts of evolutionary time. 